Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for being back with us this evening. We're going to flip over to the book of Hebrews tonight, the little flipsy, topsy-turvy, whatever you want to call it from this morning. We went to James this morning. We've been in James at, James at night, so we went to James this morning. We're going to do Hebrews this evening. Not going to keep you too long. Uh, you do see some folks running around with either Awana shirts on or this shirt, and this is the mission shirt for those that are leaving out, and we're going to pray over them uh, uh, toward the end of the service today and uh, looking forward to uh, hearing the stories back from them, but we want to get them down there safely and get them back safely before, before um, uh, we hear those stories. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. The title of the message tonight is Remembering the Faithful, Remembering the Faithful. This is really um, what we're called to do when you think about this morning and the message that uh, laid out as far as uh, acting, uh, acting those, putting those things into action, the things that, that we talk about with that kind of faith we want to have, but then there's actually a roadmap to that. And James really kind of gives us a roadmap, the steps we're to take in order to have that kind of faith. Well, here in God's Word, what he does, he actually goes back and recalls the names of those who had great faith in the beginning. And, and so it's kind of a, a recognition of what they did. And the Bible gives us this wonderful collection of heroes, witnesses to the faith that have gone before us in great faith. And so God recognizes that. You know, my wife had mentioned to me earlier, and y'all continue to pray for her. She sounds a lot worse than I do. Um, but um, this week is 9-11. Uh, you know, for those of us that have been around a little bit, 9-11 uh, is certainly one of those markers in our past. And you can probably tell me where you were whenever it happened. I remember exactly where I was. Um, but folks, that was 23 years ago. It doesn't seem, doesn't seem like that at all. I was in a classroom in Slocum teaching school, and one of the oddest things that I can, just a little story that I can tell you from it, um, every day in my class, I had a 7th and 8th grade history class, and every day in my class, um, we would do two questions, and I would just put the questions on the board, and then they would have to find the answer sometime before we got to like number 25 or 30 or whatever it was. And they were just basic informational questions. Sometimes it was geography questions, sometimes it was just different kinds of questions, just basic information they needed to know. And y'all know how important the number 11 was on that day. You know, there was a lot of symbolism around the number 11 and stuff. Well, our, our questions that day were number 11 and 12. And I won't ever forget this, and I have my kids write it down. The number question, the number 11 question that day, this gives me goosebumps a little bit. The number 11 question on that day, before all this took place, was what are acts of violence against innocent people called? Anybody want to guess the name, the answer? Terrorism. That was the, que that was the question on the board that day in my class. Now, you're talking about really kind of messing with you a little bit. That, that, that one really got me. But uh, it's hard to believe that was 23 years ago. But we do still mark that day as, as one of those days that's tragic in our uh, nation's history. But, you know, we have a lot of memorials that are dedicated to, to so many different things, events, people groups, wars and such. Uh, I've had the privilege, as, as many of you have, of going to Arlington National Cemetery before, and that is a humbling place to go. Um, if you are, whether you served in the military or not, that's a place that certainly will humble you. And, you know, when they do the changing of the guard ceremony, one of the most impressive things that I've ever seen, and the, the, the meticulous detail in which they uh, take great honor and privilege in honoring the dead. And this is actually not just the dead. This is someone that's really unknown. That's why it's called the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, but that soldier represents the many that lost their lives in service for our country and our nation. So um, we spend and we see the value and, and, and the importance of honoring uh, those who gave their life in faithful service to our nation. Um, God takes that same amount of effort and, and, go, and takes it to a new extreme when he honors those that were most faithful, many of them who, left, who lost their lives in honor and service to his name, right? And that's really what chapter 11 in Hebrews is about. It's, it's called the Hall of Faith uh, oftentimes, but you can just imagine how the Lord feels when we honor him, right? When we honor him the way he truly deserves, and, and truly anybody who, who um, gives their life, whether uh, through martyrdom or just an entire life devoted to him um, and serving him is considered a, a true hero in the faith. And, and we are privileged to be that when we serve a life 
uh, dedicated to him. And, and God does that here with some of the earliest patriarchs and some of the earliest matriarchs here uh, in chapter 11. Of course, we know the background. I've kind of gone over it a couple of times about these were some of the Jewish Christians who had become very discouraged in their faith. And this new faith was kind of proving difficult for them. It was a really a radical change in the way they had been living their life. As, as a Jew, you had to be very dedicated to your faith. You couldn't just be a halfway Jew in that time. You needed to really be committed. And, and to be a faithful Jew, it took a lot of change for you to su suddenly uh, swap over to Christianity. And, and so this went against their long-held traditions of belief and faith. And, and things had started to get rough. And there was persecutions that were starting to come about. And so as a result of that, many of them were looking to turn back to what they knew was comfortable. You know, I, it'd be so much easier just to go back to what I know and, and not have to deal with all this other persecution and everything that's coming toward these Christians. And I call myself a Christian right now, but, you know, I'm also Jewish, and I got that, I got that safety net I can fall back on. And, and, and that's their view of it. And, and in doing so, they really showed the immaturity in their faith. But as many of them were ready to turn back and, and leave this uneasy, unchartered waters of faith— um, they found out that they had to make a choice. They had to make a decision in their life. They, had to, to, they could either have their dependency upon the law or follow Jesus. You know, it was, it was um, do I try to appease God by keeping this checklist of rules and, and laws and expectations, or do I try to trust in Him and please Him in faith? I can go through this very complicated religious system of, of, of this stuff. Even though I'm very familiar with it, there's still a lot to it. Or I can just nurture this simple relationship with a man named Jesus, right? And, and that was the choice that many of them were having to make. And um, So what the writer of Hebrews does, he kind of reminds a lot of these uh, immature Jewish believers now of the superiority of Christ, the superiority of Him, how He was higher than the angels, how He's higher than the prophets, how He's higher than Moses. And so that Jesus, this Jesus is not just your average, average, uh, average everyday run-of-the-mill run prophet. This is somebody who is the Son of the living God. And so chapter 11 really emphasizes who Jesus is, and He begins first by emphasizing faith, the importance of faith, and active faith that we've been talking about. And he gives us examples of not just people that had the faith, but they lived it out in their life. They were, they were actively engaged in their life. And, and he goes back and says, you know what? The ones that I'm going to point out to you, most of them were Jewish, right? He's going to point out people that stepped out on faith, and they weren't stepping out on faith upon their Jewish background. They were stepping out in faith in trusting God. And so he's kind of highlighting, yeah, I know it's kind of shaky waters right now for you. I know it's kind of, things are kind of tough. But you got to remember, our forefathers, the Jewish forefathers and matriarchs, some of the faith, they were willing to take a step out and trust God. And so that's what the writer of Hebrew wants to do here. He wants to point to him that in from the beginning of, um, of all of this, these faithful Jewish patriarchs placed their faith, their trust by acting on their faith. They did something. And so that's kind of why it's known as the Hall of Faith. So turn with me, if you will, in Hebrews 11. I'm going to read a couple of verses, jump around a little bit, but just to look at some of the examples that the Lord, not, this is not man's collection of, 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 of his top ten list or anything like that. This is the Lord highlighting specific names of individuals who not only had faith, but had an active faith. Let's go to him and pray this, more, uh, this evening, and then we'll read the text. Father, Lord... Thank you again for this evening, Lord. Thank you for this time where we can come back into your house, Lord. I, Lord, I pray for strength tonight. Lord, I ask that you hide me behind your cross, Lord. Give me um, the words to say, Lord, that speak your truth to your people. And Lord, may someone be encouraged uh, in their own faith from the reading of your text and, and the preaching of your word. And I'll be sure to give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we've already preached on this once before on a Sunday morning, but keep going. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Look down in verse 6, if you will. We're going to pick up there for a second. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, meaning please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is 
and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when you read those first two verses, combine it with verse 6, you see what God is calling important, faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. All your elders had this faith, had this kind of faith. They had a good testimony. And then he goes on to tell them what happens if you don't have this faith, right? Look in verse 6. But without faith, without this kind of faith, all you Jewish faithful people, the ones that want to that uh, rely upon your Jewish roots, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So he's reminding them that, yes, I've, I, I, Judaism was part of getting to Christianity, right? It was the foundation to build to where he was going to bring the Messiah into the world. And he's saying it's great that you can check a box and do the things that you're called to do and be, and be obedient in that sense. But I've called you to a greater faith. And without that faith, it is impossible to please God. So he's emphasizing that here. In other words, we're not sure what the future holds, but we sure know who holds the future. Amen? And that's what he's calling us to understand. It's clinging to a hope. Remember how I told you how to describe the kind of hope in the Bible? It's not a hope with I hope it happens. It's a hope with an exclamation point knowing that it's going to happen. Right? God is going to, what God's Word says is going to happen. It's going to be fulfilled exactly as he says it's going to be fulfilled. We may be confused by it. We may not be aware of, of all the things that are going to happen. But God has no doubt whatsoever that the things he says is going to happen is going to happen. And we just have to cling to that. And I mean cling to it. What do you, what do you think of when you think about clinging? You know, I think about me as a, as a little kid the first time I ever went to Waterworld, right, and jumped in that big old wave pool. Never seen the wave pool before. We just went to a a park that had a pool as far as I knew I go out there and get in that pool and believe it or not I was shorter than I am now <laughs> and I get out there and I hear this big alarm y'all know what I'm talking about I was out in the middle all of a sudden this little man was doing his best just to get to the side right and I was over there on the side and these big old waves are coming and I am literally like clinging to the side, right? Because the sides are pretty tall. You can't really grab hold of anything. And I was clinging for dear life. That's what you think about when you think about clinging, right? You're clinging to that truth, meaning I don't care what else is happening to your life. I don't care how the circumstances are about to beat you down and put you under, right? You're still clinging to the hope that is Christ. Is that the way we live our life? Or sometimes is it easy just to kind of back off a little bit? Well, these Jews were ready to back off a little bit. They weren't ready to cling to the truth of Jesus Christ. Things were starting to get rough. People were starting to persecute. Uh, rumors were spreading about who these people were that were following Jesus and who weren't. And so that some of them are like, hey, I'd rather be in the group that says they're not following Jesus as long as it don't bring turmoil into my life. Right? I, I'm going to take the easy way all, out. Folks, that day may come for us one day. It very well may. So faith is clinging to the hope, clinging to it, that God will eventually triumph. We know he will. Amen? He is the victor. We get to experience that victory through Christ. Even if we don't see it in our lifetimes, you cling to that truth to the very, very end. And when he returns, when he returns, not if he returns, but when he returns in judgment, he will reward those who sought after him. That's not your preacher telling you that. That's what God's Word says. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. When you, when you hear the word diligently seeking Him, do you think of that, the, those kind of faiths I talked about this morning where it was kind of a dead faith, you know, yeah, I believe, and I know there's a God, and whatever. Or do you think about an active faith? When you say you are diligently, diligently, diligently seeking Him, you can't diligently do anything without being active, right? And so that's an active kind of faith that he's talking about here. And as a result, what do we do? We obey. We try to obey the things of God. We try to obey what he's called us to do. Uh, we try to be obedient to his word, to his guidance in our life and what his will is for our life, and really just to follow in the ways of God as he's laid out for us in his will. 
John 14, 15 says, If you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's laid it out for us. He, want, he knows we should know what he wants for us to do. The hard part should not be trying to figure out what it he wants for us to do. The hard part is actually doing it. You know, everybody says, well, it's easy to be a Christian. Yeah, it's easy to become a Christian. But now living out the Christian life can be difficult oftentimes. In verses 4, 5, and 6, I think I put them up there too. 4, 5, and 7, excuse me. Notice the responses on all of them. By faith, he starts with Abel. Remember, <laughs> he was one of the original four. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Or Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. He did something. He had an active faith toward God. He was offering a sacrifice to God, and his sacrifice was considered greater than Cain. And it says, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. He had an active faith, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. In other words, through the ages we know of the, of the name of Abel because he was faithful to God. Next verse, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. We know the story. He and God were walking along, right? And, 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 and God thought the world of Enoch, and so much so that he just called him up. Notice what it says. He was taken away and was not found because God had taken him. For before he had taken him, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Well, we just read the Scripture just two minutes ago. What is the way we please God? Verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what do we know Enoch had? Faith. He had great faith, a great, great faith that God just called him on up. Verse 7, by faith Noah. If you've been here on Wednesday nights, we just finished up the part about Noah. Noah being divinely warned of the things not, seen, not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Again, we see great faith in action. And these names are being recognized because of their faith. A little bit further down in verse 8, notice again, by faith Abraham did what? Obeyed. He was obedient. He was active in his faith when he was called out to go to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. Going down a little further, verse 11, by faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged him faithful who had promised. What does that mean? She put her faith and trust in the one who made a promise to her. So Abraham and Sarah believed God, and as a result, they obeyed God, regardless of the consequences, no matter what was coming into their way. Now, we're going to continue on Wednesday nights talking about some of the flaws that we see or lapses in his faith that Abram, Abram or Abraham has. But God recognizes him for his great faith. And it is this kind of willing trust that pleases God, as verse 6 says. He is a rewarder of those who seek him diligently. Those who do not have faith cannot see past the physical world that's all around them. That's, that's when we refer to spiritual blindness, right? Right? They don't have faith. They, they're, they're caught up in what's going on around them. They're limited, in a sense, by their temporary circumstances, what's going on in their life, and are blind to what God is doing in their life. I've, I, listen, I've talked with people. I'm sure Brother Gary has counseled people before. They're lost. And I, it's not me making a judgment. It's just from the fruit in their life and just to hear them talk about their relationship with the Lord. But it's sad to hear them in a condition of spiritual blindness. All they see are their physical circumstances. That's all they react to. That's all they worry about. That's all they deal with are the circumstances of their life right now. There's no investment in the spiritual aspect of their life. One of the reasons is because they're spiritually blind. They don't, they, don't, they don't see a need for those things. They don't recognize a need for those things because they're lost. Matthew 16, 8 says, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye 
of little faith, why you reason among yourselves. We can talk through things, and we can reason things out, and you can use all the logic in the world. But if you don't have faith, you're going to come to an empty conclusion. Matthew 8, 26, Jesus says, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Little faith, when you have little faith, you're going to have greater fear. <laughs> but all it takes is the faith of a mustard seed. So how little does that faith have to be? You ever seen a mustard seed? I mean, good luck. My eyes won't even let me see one anymore. They're so small. Just demonstrate a little faith. See, faith is a gift from God himself. And it's not earned by anyone in here or anybody outside of here. The only way faith is earned is by Christ on the cross. That's how faith is earned. But it's like a muscle. And what do you have to do for a muscle? You have to use it, right? Even if you hurt it, right, Brad? You're just telling me today. Muscles have to be exercised to be strengthened, right? You have to exercise your faith if you want strong faith. And if we sit on our hands and never do anything and never trust God for, to just step out there on the, on, the, on the ledge sometimes, we just, you're not, exer you, you look like me. <laughs> not a lot of exercise going on there, and therefore you don't have a lot of muscle tone. Muscle tone is just a reflection of our faith. I pray that we have the most spiritually fit church anywhere around here. But that's through exercising of our faith and trusting in Him. And real faith, as I mentioned this morning, involves the mind. It's a perception of how things are. You must accept, you must believe in the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what he did upon the cross as a fact. There's no question about it. I don't care what kind of, I don't care what kind of uh, documentary the History Channel puts on or any of this other stuff. It doesn't raise any questions in your mind because you know that's a settled fact in your life. Right? Some of that stuff they put on there, you go, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I don't know. Throw some question marks in your life. T can I tell you, there is no question mark in your life if you are, if you are faith-filled about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't care what kind of evidence they come up with one day. I don't care what kind of—if they bring, dig up a, an eyewitness to come up and say, but can I tell you, i got a whole lot more eyewitnesses in here that say it happened as God said it happened. There should be nothing that contradicts or raises doubts about that fact. That should be settled here between your ears, right? He's a fact, and then you understand not just the fact that it happened— but you have to begin to understand what the implications of that fact are in your life. If Jesus came to this earth, why did he have to come? For my sin and for your sin, right? And if he came for my sin and your sin, that tells me that I need a sinner and you need a, I mean, I need a savior and you need a savior, right? Because we're all sinners. And so I have to understand that implication in my life. And that's something I need to understand here. It affects the mind. And faith is not blind. We talk about blind faith. Faith is only as valid as the truth it's placed in. I can have faith that this right here would hold me up, and it might today, but it might not tomorrow. I know it won't in a thousand years. But now when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I don't care if it's today, tomorrow, or 10,000 years from now, it's solid. See, that, that's the kind of faith. And that's settled for me right here. And that's the first step of our faith is it needs to be settled here between your ears first. Don't let somebody try to talk. If somebody can talk you into believing in Jesus, somebody can talk you out of believing. That's what Satan does. That needs to be settled in our life. It's also part of our emotion, our persuasion, how we're persuaded. You may, you may be persuaded to receive the gospel, but knowledge does not mean acceptance of the gospel. 
Somebody, somebody may hear it in here tonight for the very first time and say, you know what, that, that sounds pretty good. That, that's good stuff. I, you know, I, now I have a better understanding of things. But just because you understand it, I mean, you accept it. So there has to be a response there, right? A conviction in knowing and accepting its truth. Not only do you know that Jesus, now you have this knowledge of why everybody comes to church and why, why people worship this man named Jesus, but you have to accept that personally in your own life. You can't accept it for your kids. You can't accept it for your spouse. You can't let your grandmother accept it for you. It has to be you and you and you and you and you and Christ alone, right? That's our response. It's a personal relationship. And then it involves the will. Told you I wouldn't keep you long, but that's the purpose, right? The purpose of what we do with our life. A person's will responds to a personal commitment and a complete acceptance of Christ as your only hope of salvation. The only way you're ever going to be saved is through Jesus Christ. When you have that assurance, that, and your will lives that way, when you have the will to drive to say, you know what, the only way I'm ever going to be saved is through Jesus Christ, my will should be driven toward Jesus Christ. And if we have conflicts in that, if I, I think I'm going to be good enough, and I think I'm going to work, uh, work my way into heaven, or I think, I think that, um, you know, these people will tell me there's more than one way out there, and, but I'm going, to, I'm going to devote myself to Jesus, but there's probably other ways out there. No, 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 folks. That is not a wheel. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through the Son. And that, we have to have that kind of determination in our will. We may be presented other options one day. I know that's one of the things I get so discouraged about when our kids go off to college is they hear a lot of stuff. They get exposed to a lot of things. And some of it sounds very good here. And some of it might even tug on this right here. But if you've got them grounded in their wheel right here in, in church, and you and, and like the old saying, they got a drug problem, right? They kept drug to church over and over again. But I pray that it was more than that. I hope they become addicted to it right here. Because they're going to get exposed to a lot more than what we hear. But that has to be settled in their life. And then their will, their purpose in life is driven toward that only hope. The only hope you have, the only hope I have, the only hope any of us have in eternal salvation. That's why it's called a saving faith. Real faith is not just simply knowing about it. It's not just simply feeling it or even just acting it's all those things combined. We, it must involve trust, which is faith, and then response, which is action. Sounds like what, what we've been talking about the last three or four weeks, doesn't it? Faith and works, right? The action that is involved with it. Faith and works. Some of you like that word faithing and action word. That's what it is. It's really, it's faith in action. It's faith on the move. Faith does things. Faith works. What kind of faith do you live for in your life? What is your will set upon? Is it upon salvation in Christ and Christ alone? Is, he set, is that a settled fact between your ears and in your heart and in your steps? Because that's what we're called to have. And that's the kind of faith I want to encourage you toward tonight. So.